Good morning, good afternoon. Oh, I guess it's officially good afternoon now. Uh, I am Liz Litkowski. I work at Payson Systems. I'm basically the data product manager. So perhaps unlike some of the discussions that we've had so far, I'm in the business of providing products for our customers. And so as I talk about Tableau a bit, I'm going to be talking a bit about how we've embedded Tableau in the offerings that we provide to our customers. So a slightly different um, kind of application of Tableau that, than I think we've, we've seen thus far. Um, but, and basically, my product offerings are around data. So um, it's hosting data, it's delivering data, it's providing analysis of data. So every product offering that I've got um, is related to that. Payson. And a lot of you guys are from the industry, so I did prepare this a bit more for kind of the basic oil and gas 101, so stop me if I'm getting a little too kindergarten here. Um, Payson is basically in the business of helping our customers put holes in the ground. So for the purpose of getting oil and gas out, but basically in the business of helping to create that hole. Um, so it's about real-time drilling data. It's about sensors that are sitting out at a rig site and taking that data from a rig site, bringing it back into an office environment. All during the drilling process, all real-time, but also providing data um, at a historical level for our customers, we, uh, I like to say that we did cloud before cloud was cool. Um, we've been storing customer data in a cloud environment since 1999. And so we've got that 15 years of data that is available for our customers to be able to go back and look at what they've done. Now, interestingly enough, of course, one customer said to me, well, is that data any good anymore? Um, since technology, drilling technology has changed so dramatically in the last couple of years, really just going back a few years is really what's relevant in, in terms of trying to analyze data. But Payson, and, and so our roots are actually from quite a simple world. In the beginning, um, when Payson was first started about 25 years ago, we were all about a single product that physically lived at the rig. And it was basically about measuring mud. Um, the mud that goes down hole being basically equal to the mud that comes back up the hole, otherwise you got a problem. So it, we started, we're a Canadian company. We started in Canada and our original product, the pit volume totalizer, um, was about safety. So essentially, if the mud process is not working properly, then um, there could be a safety issue at the rig. And in Canada, this is actually a mandated product, um, unlike in the US, but it's a mandated product on every rig that drills a well. So it was kind of a good environment for us to start a business. And we moved into the United States um, in the late 90s. Um, basically acquired a company in Colorado and, and moved down down to the U.S. at that at that point in time, but so there was one product, a bunch of rigs, and certainly in that 25-year time span, the number of rigs that have been drilling in the North American land market um, has been volatile, and only been increasing in the last you know say five years or so. So um, very kind of basic beginnings like anybody would talk about in terms of you know two guys in the garage starting a business but that was that was the original beginning of Payson so it was fairly simplistic only one product a few rigs gathering gathering data since then of course um, a lot of things have changed right it used to just be a straight hole and now it's a hole that bends um, and so the data associated with that process, as you can imagine, becomes increasingly challenging in this kind of world because not only do I have to know where it is, I have to know how to avoid running into something else I've already drilled or somebody else has already drilled, 
um, I have to understand a bit more about what it takes to make that turn um, in the well. And so there's tons of data. Um, it, interestingly, in, in terms of the discussion we heard this morning from Neil deGrasse Tyson about we didn't even know some of the questions to ask until we had the data. So s similarly, we didn't even know the questions to ask that were going to be considerably different now that we have new technology for, for being able to drill that well. So, so a, a much different kind of problem. And in North American, the North American land environment, for those of you who are in the industry, you know this, um, there are more than 2,000 rigs drilling every day in the North American land market. And in the case of Payson, we are potentially providing data for more than 200 um, inputs or sensors from that, those rigs. And that data is coming in at a one second to 10 second rate. So there's a lot of data. <laughs> it's easy to, to do the math pretty quickly and, and say that there is a lot of data coming in. And this is just an example of what that data looks like today. It, it's interesting when you think about what are the right ways to be able to look at data and what's the signature associated with the data. When you're trying to do historical analysis to then say, I, I just drilled five wells on this same pad and now I want to be able to drill a six well and I want to do a better job than I did on the last five wells. How do I look at the data to be able to make that determination? What do I do differently based on the data that I've seen in the past that will help me for the future? When you, when you talk to drillers that are out at the rig and are used to looking at data this way in a time series kind of approach, they can look at the data and immediately recognize the patterns. And yet, one of the things that we're seeing in the industry is that there's, um, we talk about the great crew change. Um, in the industry where there's a lot of people that are retiring and yet the younger people who are coming on board really want to be able to look at the data in quite a different way. So just being able to look at a time series and reading those sensors um, from one step to the next doesn't necessarily show the pattern. And in fact, sometimes in the data there are patterns that arise that you might not have thought of if you're just looking at sort of a snapshot. Um, nevertheless, this is the kind of thing that you would see at the rig, that the drillers would see. They can switch on and off which sensors they're looking at, but essentially it's how much can the human mind actually comprehend if you're looking at the data just kind of in a raw way. When I started, I, I'm actually a computer scientist, not, a, I'm not necessarily um, an oil and gas <coughs> expert for all of my career. Um, I used to read core dumps from operating systems and I could recognize the hexadecimal patterns and I knew immediately what was going on but just by reading the patterns and it was just a bunch of numbers, right? But you start recognizing patterns after a while as do our, our folks out at the rig. But there's a labor shortage, right? A lot of people are retiring in the industry and then there's new folks coming in. What's the best way to represent that data so that those people are um, not only making the best decisions, but also learning about the process as well. So those are some of the things that we like to help our customers with. And of course, sometimes we get quite frustrated with what that data is. Um, so it's not so obvious. And of course, each audience is different as well. Um, so in terms of, of just trying to solve those problems or help our customers solve the problems, what I like to say to our customers is I'm not a drilling engineer. I have a lot of data that's valuable to drilling engineers, but I'm not a drilling engineer. The best I can do for you is, is present the data in such a way that you can start making decisions about what to do next. So one other thing I wanted to point out, kind of back to our basic mission at Payson. Our mission is technology deployed simply, and so at the rig site, that means things like um, the equipment works. It's highly reliable. The data that comes off of the equipment is um, accurate and precise, and you can tell how accurate it is. Um, and if something goes wrong, we fix it for you. We've got a big customer service element in our field force um, that enables that. So 
We want to be able to take that notion of technology deployed simply that happens at the rig site and bring that back to the office user and bring that back to um, the person who's looking at the data. So with all of this multitude of data that's coming from the field, being able to provide that to our users in a simple way is part of the, of the message that we're trying to do as we're building products for our customers. So it's not enough just to have a big database of data. I wanted to be able to use it more effectively. And so that's where Tableau comes in to play. So again, sorry for the people that are oil and gas in the room. A couple different definitions. Operator um, is the person basically that owns the rights to drill for oil and gas. The contractor is the, is the organization that does the drilling process itself, that owns the rigs. Um, that drill the oil and gas well. And then tower sheet data, and I'm pronouncing that correctly for the industry. Um, we like to say it's some blend of somebody from Canada coming down and talking to somebody in Texas, and somehow that was pronounced tower instead of tour, um, like we would know in the English language. But that is how it's called, how it's described in our industry. It's basically, um, think of it as a very, very complicated timesheet. So the contractor, as they're providing data to bill their customer, the operator, they're providing a list of what was happening during a 24-hour period. So typically there's shifts. Um, quite often it's 12-hour shifts. But every 15 minutes there's data captured about what was going on at the rig. Um, it's manually entered. It is human beings that are on the rig that are, are keeping track of that. But things like any kind of safety incidents that might have happened at the rig, what kind of mud was being used, what kind of bits were being used, all of that data is captured in the tower sheet because that's how the contractor will bill the operator at the end of the day. So they do that and it's on this very massive, huge paper version. It, of course, has been electronified over the years, but it's still kind of an ugly piece of paper even when you look at it um, as the folks are filling it out. There's a ton of data inside of those sheets, though. So they typically have come out in a PDF kind of document. You can print them out. Um, the company man who's on site can sign off on the sheet, and, and that gets passed as these were legitimate charges that are going to happen. But we want to be able to mine that data, though. So even though it was manually entered and it's every 15-minute increments, there's a lot of data in there. And so we've created what we call our Tower Sheet Analytics Dashboard. A um, couple of key things that, so if I am an operator and I have several drilling contractors who are working for me, the most basic thing that I'd like to do is, is be able to to slice and dice that data by who's doing work for me. So if I'm in a particular geographic region, which I can select with the map function inside Tableau, I want to be able to look at a cluster of rigs and see how well those rigs are performing for me. It might be that one particular drilling contractor is doing a better job than another drilling contractor, but that may be very localized to a region. So looking at it by contractor, looking at it by geographical region is quite a useful way for me to look at the data. The contractors hate that, of course. You know, the contractor customers that I've talked to say, but now my operator's just going to be, you know, looking at me and comparing. I'm like, the nature of supply and demand, right? We are in a market-based <laughs> environment. And so that's an expected part of the story. So that's how an operator might look at it. But if I'm a contractor, I might be looking at the operators that I'm doing business for and I know what my drilling practices are, but it could be that the operator is determining a very specific well program, and I'm limited by what that well program is based on what the operator is doing. And so I can even see, if I'm the, coming in as the contractor, I can see how the different operators may be impacting what's going on for that particular region. And I might have advice, in fact, to specific operators and be able to offer another level of service because I can provide the data to show that. One of our customers, who was a contractor customer, 
said to us, you know, I get this from my customer all the time. They show me the data about how well I'm performing against my competitors. Can't you guys provide me something that I can refute that with the with my customer? Give me more data to be able to, to specify that. And so there's an op opportunity to do that. This is quite simplistic, and yet because that data is on these big, ugly sheets that start out as PDF documents, it's hard to do for um, our customers to be able to just take that data and assemble it themselves. So since we've got all that data captured for 15 years, we've got all that data captured, we can enable that more easily. And because it's in our cloud environment and we can feed it into a Tableau server, kind of environment. Our customers basically using the same kind of security privileges that they would to access our data in the old-fashioned way, they, they can get access to, to Tableau as well. I don't, this one doesn't have a pointer, but what you'll see up here at the top is the Payson Data Hub, which has a lot of other capabilities. We've essentially built Tableau into that environment um, under our analytics tab. And essentially, it's seamless as you work from one part of the product to the next. So that, that's an offering. And then one of the other things that's important about this, so it's not just let me look at who my contractors are, let me look at who my operators are, but let me look at some of these codes. So these time codes that somebody might have filled in at the drilling rig, it's about was my rig up or down? Was I actually drilling? Was I tripping out of the hole? Um, how much time did I actually spend on bottom? I interestingly, just this basic data that, again, was manually entered, um, the amount of time spent actually making hole, so bit, drill bit on the bottom and making new hole, it's probably in the range of 30 to 40 percent of the time. The rest of the time is, surrounds all of the process needed to make that happen safely and effectively. Um, and some crews can do that better than others. Um, so, so lots of time code data, lots of different ways of looking at the data. I may be a drilling engineer and I am interested just in the wells that I'm responsible for and so I can turn everything off and then just look at the, at the data that are, that are relevant to me. Okay, there's pie charts. So <laughs> I, I just learned in the last two days, you're not supposed to do pie charts. And in, f and in, fact, <laughs> and in fact, what's interesting to me, there's some really obvious things. So if I'm trying to think about, so what I've done here is just show various rigs to show how much time is spent on those various rigs in each of the different states. And my first inclination was to at least do it in a bar chart because it was more comparable and I tried to do that with a lot of our customers and they wouldn't let me. They made me. They made me do it in pie charts. I had to. <laughs> so just to offer something that our customers were comfortable with, we did. We did pie charts. What was also interesting, we used this at a trade show a few weeks ago and at the Unconventional Resources Tech Conference that was in Denver um, just a couple weeks ago. and. A guy from one of our drilling contractor customers came up, and we were showing him the various wares, and he's like, is this real data? And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, it's, we've changed the names to protect the innocent, but it's real data. And he's like, that is so true. My top drives are always down. And I'm like, well, you know, is that like a vendor problem? Is that? I, I, I can't tell you any more than that, but that's the problem. He's like, that is real data. It's always like that. I'm like, actually, that is what we've seen that in the data when we look at it that way. So... Um, so this one in particular, the rig repair, it's called, it's called Code 8. Um, it, it's a code that happens. It's one of the codes that customers must enter as part of their process. It's also related to how they get paid, and they don't like to use Code 8. So what you'll find is it gets right close to the edge of, of Code 8, and then they just, they're just shy of it, so they, they don't like even how we sometimes round the data up because that influences how they get paid. So, um, But everybody's really interested in this, in this part because it means the rig's not making any progress. I'm down, I'm not, I'm not making any progress, I'm not, getting, I'm not getting to the product faster. So that's a pretty important part 
of this is we actually, I, I originally wanted to start with the summary dashboard, which I just did a minute ago, but our customers said make this the first chart that you see when you come in. So we've done different tabs for um, various things. And I hate this guy, but I couldn't find anything better when I was looking for art for this. But uh, simple things like when a rig is moving, it's not drilling. So um, there's been big studies in our industry about the amount of time it might take to move rig down, rig back up again, and start drilling the next hole. Um, a, an operator who has a very specific budget for a year of drilling can go from, I'm going to get 10 wells, and I thought I was going to get 10 wells, but now that you've improved your rig move process, I can get 11 wells in the same budget that I already had because I don't have to wait so much time in between. Um, so really basic things, but, but that's one of the simple things that we've graphed here. And you can look at different best practice sharing amongst crews. So if I've got one rig that's performing particularly well, what's different about what that rig crew is doing than the next rig crew is doing. Again, I'm not necessarily providing the answers, but it's so much simpler to find out where to look for those answers if you've got the data summarized and visual, visualized. And then if it's, you know, if one particular product, like the guy was telling me about his top drives, um, maybe it's time to start looking at the supplier for that. So that could be a clue that's provided from the data. So that Date. That product that we were describing is out on the market. It's available for our customers, um, but that's kind of just the launch pad for, for where we're starting next. Um, my dream, I'll save my dream till the end. and Maybe somebody in the room can help me with that. A um, little bit more vocabulary, and again, apologies to experts in the room. Horizontal well is basically one that has a straight line that goes like this. Um, vertical well is just the straight hole that we started with in the oil and gas industry. ROP is the rate of penetration, so basically how fast I am creating hole um, when I'm drilling. And then the whole section is, is it really are these main three parts, and, and I'm simplifying a little bit here just for discussion purposes, but the vertical part of the well, the curve, so when you're actually making that bend and then the horizontal. And what we found is that because we have all that data, not just about what somebody filled out manually, but we're actually taking the feeds from the sensors on a one second or sometimes sub one second data perspective, um, what's all that data in there and what's it telling me? So the most basic graph that we're working on, and this is actually in prototype, the beautiful thing about Tableau is I can use this as a prototyping mechanism that I can put in front of my customers and say, is this what you meant? So instead of just having to describe it and have the conversation, I can use it as a way to have a good dialogue about the products that we're trying to build. So one other little bit that's in the back of this, if you're sitting in an office um, and not physically at the rig site, you don't necessarily know unless you're good at that pattern recognition, you don't necessarily know what kind of process is happening at the rig. So uh, underneath this, we've built in a capability to determine what the state is of the rig. So am I drilling? Am I sliding? Which basically means turning the drill bit off, but, but just kind of moving down through the hole. Um, am I tripping out? So am I pulling out of the hole? Based on the different sensor data, we can do an automatic detection of what's going on at that rig. And so we call that automatic rig activity detection. So it's a little bit like the astrophysics examples. It, we call it what it is. Um, and so being able to look at what state was going on with a particular rig at a particular time can be quite a useful thing to know especially if you're trying to analyze the data afterwards. So the simple way that our customers start looking at the data is time versus depth. So it's just, I started at the surface and I'm trying to drill holes and how many days did it take me to do that? Typically, if you're on these multi-pad wells, um, you're trying to create a factory environment where you're trying to drill um, 
in a consistent way, one of our customers has recently said to me, I don't even care if it's absolutely the best well, but I at least want it to be replicable and consistent so that as I make improvements, it's consistently across my entire fleet instead of just the one rig crew that happens to be the best. So I want to do it consistently. But if you look at the very the blue line, you know, that well took 26 days to drill and the yellow line only took 16 days. 10 days is huge in a drilling process. There's on a land rig, and this is not anything compared to offshore rigs, but on a land rig, it's $100,000 a day, easily, um, that you're spending. And so if you, because people spend, that's how things are charged in the industry, shaving those 10 days off, I've saved a million dollars on drilling that well. So that's kind of important. Um, so we're playing with the right way to, to do this, but um, notionally, we've taken that entire 26-day period and mapped it into all these different rig states um, using these, these color coatings. Not sure that's the best way to show it. Um, we've actually talked about putting, and I don't have that slide in here, but just talked about putting the different states on the time and depth curve itself just to show, oh, here's, here's some flat time. I wasn't making any progress at all. What was I doing? You know, what was actually happening on that rig during that time? And is that, does that provide insight? But remember back to that picture where I was drawing the different points of the curve. There's quite different physics that are happening at each of these steps of the process. And so it's important to be able to look at the parameters, um, the sensor parameters, the drilling parameters by each of those sections. So essentially we're taking these three wells and dividing them into the whole sections. We're looking at the days in the curve you know, what has happened in this section of the curve. And so that means we are trying to normalize essentially across these different wells and provide a zero point and then compare what was happening in those zero points. <laughs> so if you look at the days in the curve and try to compare the wells, there's not a whole lot of difference that's going on there. So that's useful to know. Um, and yet there was still that one well that took forever to drill, um, but maybe it was something that happened during the horizontal because there are quite different patterns that show up when you look at the horizontal. So again, using a Tableau kind of basic structure, we did have to do a bit of massaging of the data to figure out when each of these points. This was my session with the Tableau doctor actually yesterday. <laughs> like, how do I do this automatically? Um, but basically meaning that I've got to do some calculations behind the scenes before I can feed it in to Tableau to make those normalized kinds of curves. But that's interesting. So if I'm, you know, and this is this kind of goes back and forth with the complexity that you put in front of a user and the choices that you put in front of a user. I've heard repeatedly, there's, you know, one customer said to me, there's only four things that the guy at the rig can, affect, can do to affect this. And so just show them those four things. Well, and then the next guy said, well, but there's four more that are kind of interesting as well. So it's narrowing in on, what are the right kinds of choices um, that don't overwhelm the user. But whole section could be one way of looking at this. It could be the most basic starting point to say, all right, now I know this is where I want to focus and this is where I want to drill down and start looking at more data to see what could happen. And so drilling bits are a big part of the industry and actually the bit companies that might, I mean, somebody from a bit company might be in the room, so I should be careful what I say. But, um, you know, bit companies will often provide data to say, here's the best bit to use at this, in this particular formation, at this particular part of the well, um, and here's the data to prove that. So this is a mechanism to take the data. So bit data is the manually entered data. Um, the sensor readings are automatically generated and fed to the system, and so marrying those two data sets is an important part of this as well. So um, how much was my rate of penetration increasing when I used this particular kind of bit? And certainly that's going to be different by whole section again. You know, typically you go a little faster at the straight hole, and then as you're doing the curve, then it's you know, a whole different ball of wax. So you'll, you'll basically see that the rate of penetration decreases as you get further and further down into the hole, which is 
kind of what you would expect. When you're going this way, it's a lot slower than when you're just going straight down. Um, so, so that's a, one different way of looking at the data. Now that I have determined that there's a particular part of the whole, I need to be looking at what's the bit data that's associated with that. And then we've also some basic drilling parameters, the rate of penetration itself. I like to think of the rate of penetration as the Y variable and then the potential X variables that you can m manipulate to be able to get that. So weight on bit, it, basically the force um, of the, the drilling rig on basically on downward pressure to create that hole um, versus hook load, which is how much is not down hole and looking at the patterns of that data. So we've used scatter plots in this particular case to, to be able to show those. But we've only looked at that curve section of the hole. So looking at the parameters across the entire hole is not quite as interesting as being able to narrow down. Um, but it, it, again, it's, it's like even though there's 200 sensors potentially on the rig, there's probably 6 to 12 that people really care about. Um, in terms of being able to use. So I've, I've been able to successfully gather that, that kind of information from our customers as, you were, as you we're building this product. So um, again, and I'm getting the feedback by using their real data and feeding it into Tableau even as we're building the, the things behind the scenes that enable the filling out of that data. Um, but, and so again, back to that delivered simply, it's I want to be able to take that complex amount of data and put it into something that is easily usable by our customers. I want to carry the mantra of technology deployed simply, and so that's why I've called it drilling insights um, delivered simply. Um, because the sooner they can get to actual production on the well, the faster their revenue comes in. So, you know, we always, back in our mission statement, we talked about being able to drill faster, more effectively, and um, safely. So those are kind of the three elements. We do a really good job on the safety, and we do a really good job on the efficiently part. But um, my dream is to be able to truly get to the effective part. So ultimately, I would like to be able to take production data and feed that together with the drilling data and say, uh, okay, this is what really matters. Like, who cares that you drilled it in 10 days? I actually produced more as a result of it. And so I, I make more money um, as a company um, because Payson helped me drill more effectively. Um, but there's a lot of different influencing factors, and we don't necessarily know which one in a particular case is the right answer. So even as I've been watching various sessions here at the conference about, you know, what's the answer that you're trying to solve, the basic answer is I'm trying to drill faster, but there's 10 factors that could affect that, and so which is the one that I really need to hone in on? How do I drive that story with the data? And then I don't necessarily have the cause and effect, but at least I know where to look. I, I know one of our customers, even when we just put the tower sheet analytics in front of them, she was like, I knew that crew wasn't telling me the truth. Like, here's the data that actually shows what they're really doing. And this is so important to me. So, um, so like I said, my dream is to marry more data sets together with this. But this is just the beginning. So thank you. That's that's all I've got today. Questions? Yes? Uh, do you have any standards to compare your data against, like industry standards, or do you derive the standards across different operators yourself? Yeah, so it, it, it's interesting. We There isn't a lot of data on the specificity of this. There are standards about um, what's the typical length of a well, um, you know, how many feet have been drilled. So there's some level of industry standard, but going down to, like, this is the best drill bit to use, this is the best parameter to use. There's lots of industry papers written, um, but it's not, it's not one of those things that the industry shares better, very readily. We've actually tried to get a group of customers together and said, 
in this specific formation, let's take all of your data and throw it in together and see if you can, you know, compare yourself to your peers. And we did that anonymously, and um, a couple, four customers agreed to do it. Usually, customers say, "I want to be able to see everybody else's data, but I don't want to give you mine to participate." So it's been hard. And we consider ourselves to be guardians of our customers' data, so we do not share that sort of thing. I think there's ways that we could do it more anonymously, um, but we have been very, very careful about that. So unfortunately, the short answer is really not. Yes? Two questions, one on the guardians of the data thing. Uh, when you host this data, do you do it in a multi-tenant environment? Yes. And that's sufficient for your customers' final order? Yeah, yeah. And then totally unrelated to that, um, with that almost overwhelming amount of data that you guys produce, do you build any visualizations based on standard deviation, anything that helps the user really narrow down? We haven't done that yet, um, but uh, some of the things that I, that I didn't share here is more one of our customers, and I think this would be valuable to several customers, is not only do we have the historic data, but we're also drilling in real time, right? And so the notion of being able to show like a histogram even of differential pressure, right, as the well is being drilled, I think would be quite useful, right? So it's just like using some simple statistics as you're doing that to be able to show it. But, but that's ultimately where we want to get to. We're just not there yet. Yes? It is fed almost in real time, not quite in real time at this point. Um, you know, it's basically there's a whole set of data that kind of populates Tableau initially and then periodically gets updated, um, but it's not quite real time yet. I don't know why it couldn't be, though, right? And so that's, uh, there's a lot of, we've been in the business of building this rig equipment for lots of years, like I said. But data visualization's not necessarily our best thing. That's why we sought a partner to do it instead of um, just building all of this ourselves. But it looked to me like Tableau would have all of that capability to do based on some of the new projects. I, I didn't even mention our mobile device. We've got a similar kind of thing, so you can, you know, anybody anywhere can look at what the, what's happening in real time. And I think Project Elastic is going to help me <laughs> make that even better. Yes. My question is kind of along those lines too. Just what are all your different data sources? Because I know you've got logical controllers, you've got a system on site. Where are you pulling this from? And from yeah. These so we're doing, we've got equipment at the rig, um, and we're on 60% of the rigs in the US and 80 per, or 95% of the rigs in Canada. So most of our market is in the land so world. It has to be your equipment. It has to so be our. Almost. Okay. Um, so there's also, if somebody else's equipment is sitting on the rig site, there's a there's a protocol called WITS, which is the well. WITS ML. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, no, actually, two different things. WITS is just a direct feed from a sensor, and it's just a set of codes. It's actually been in the industry for way longer than WITS ML. Um, and so that's like a physical sensor feed physically on the rig, so we can take those feeds from many different products and they come into our aggregator at the site, even if it's not our own mm -hmm. equipment. Um, Witsamel is a whole separate thing we can talk about independently if you want. But, but we can, if it's at the rig site, we can pull that data in, even if w our basic product at the rig is called the electronic drilling recorder, so it's an aggregator of things. So custom channels can come into that as well as our own sensors. And then that data does get indeed fed back. We don't. Okay. We've been in the drilling business forever, but I think it's worth thinking about doing all of that. Right? Yes. Do any of your customers ask you for the data that you're collecting so that they can analyze it themselves? Yes. Yeah, that happens all Are you the time. Supportive of that, or fairly? Yeah, we've actually done a couple different ways. WitsML is one of the ways that we do that. So there are third-party systems that speak this language, um, and so we can feed that into other systems and. That typically is our bigger customers doing that. Um, but then we also have people that we've created just basic data warehouses for, right? And segregated their specific data and feed them them that into whatever 
Oracle database or a lot of customers use Spotfire too to be able to <laughs> to be able to do that. We looked at Spotfire for this and it just what, didn't cut make the grade. Yes. Hi, can you speak to your mobile um, solution in terms of in, out in the field? What do field folks have and how do they communicate? Yeah, so our mobile device tends to be used by the folks that are not on the rig all the time. So at the rig itself, we've got equipment like touch screens and stuff that we're in. Sort of this earlier picture is one of our field devices. So that's like physically on the rig and that's like connected into the rig equipment. The mobile device itself, I should have brought an iPad to show this better, but the mobile device itself looks a bit like this um, in terms of what we've got today but it's basically feeding one second data to a device wherever you happen to be as long as you've got some kind of connection mechanism, um, you know, wireless or, or your, your actual cell phone provider. Um, but it looks some, somewhat similar to this in terms of form today. Um, the thing that looked interesting to me about Project Elastic was now I can take that data and start graphing what these things look like. Um, in a more interesting way than just the straight, you know, time feed. Sure. Um, but that is available today for iPhones and Androids. Yes, sir. How do you maintain the, because you have data of multiple operators sitting maybe on a single machine or a single cloud, how do you maintain the security of the data among the different operators? Yeah, so this goes back to the multi-tenant question. It, essentially, it's, you know, a couple hundred servers sitting in a cloud environment in a data center environment, very secure, very protected, um, but essentially just it's the architecture of, of the database itself that segregates that data. So you segregate it not at the tableau level but at the database level? Yeah, that's something that Payson built years ago and at the database level. Yes. Yes, sir. So all the dashboards that you have available to your customers at the, the data hub, those are all interactive yes. to your customers? Yes, so we've built them in a workbook environment and then we've published them out. So they don't have a workbook, they essentially just interact with it. Um, and I'm probably not using even the right technical terms for Tableau, but we've narrowed their choices. I guess is the best way. So they can, there's certain things they can click on and off, um, et cetera, but they are interactive with a limited set of choices. So it's not just like having their own workbook, though. And then is that available at the, the rig site as well? Because you said it's not quite live, but almost. So are people at the rig using those dashboards? They are well? not using the dashboards at the rig right now. They could be. The, the rig sites, you know, they, we send data off the rig. We actually use satellite connections as well as cellular, depending on where the rig is. Quite often the rigs are in the middle of nowhere yeah. and there's no cell phone coverage. Um, but you could, right, there's an internet capability at the rig, so you could actually bring it back down if those folks were interested. These tend to be data sets in our typical, you know, you always talk about your user persona, who you're developing this for. We're developing this for drilling engineers and for what's called optimization advisors um, in, in our, our customers. Um, so most of what we're building here is for the office guys, even though ultimately my dream is that computers all go away and it's all just devices, right? Like, what do we need computers for? <laughs> yes? Uh, do you use Splunk in any case? Uh, do you have your own systems? We actually do use Splunk internally, and I was seeing that in one of the, uh, uh, in the show. Um, it's kind of interesting to me. We do use Splunk to be able to understand how our customers are using our system. Um, and so what it looked like was really interesting was feeding that into Tableau, so I didn't realize that could be done until this week. Um, but yeah, we do use Splunk. Our developers use it as a key part of since we have so many people kind of pounding our system continuously and it's all in this cloud environment, Splunk's a pretty good tool to help us with performance and that sort of thing. So, yes. Yeah. So you mentioned that there's a, a whole lot of different data being collected from all these sensors. Mm -hmm. 
being displayed in Tableau? What's the largest uh, number of records that you've, you've used with Tableau? I don't know the answer to that. Lots of rows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so some of the, when we've been doing the prototyping work, it's kind of like we've been pulling it down into Excel just because it's an easy place to start for the prototyping before the product is built. And um, we ended up dividing it into three Excel workbooks because it's just too big to pull the data down. But I don't, I don't have that number off the top of my head. In the hosted environment, what, what have you guys found is good for the ETL and data warehouse? I don't know. <laughs> In terms of the technology used? Yeah, technology. Like Redshift versus Azure? I don't. Okay. I don't have an answer to that question. I'm a business person. <laughs> Lost my computer science from way back. Yeah? Has, has there been any customer feedback or pain points so far with using it's all been pretty positive. Um, usually the feedback is not related to Tableau itself, but it's related to what the data sets are that we're analyzing for them. Like, could you do it this way or could you do it this way? So it isn't really like the user interface part of it. Yeah, pretty much nothing on, on that so you, you part of it. Well, so we're trying not to do that. Um, our our world, the part of our sim simplicity model is is bringing out a product for the masses. So we're not really in the custom building so far. Yeah. We're not in the custom building business. Um, and so what I've tried to look for is the 80% trend of what customers are interested in. I don't know if I'm going to be able to stick to that, but that's my... That's my in going on, you know, sort of like going in hi hypothesis is that I'll be able to solve eighty percent of the problems, and then maybe have to do something on the side for customers. Yeah. How much do you find your sort of playing around in Tableau and generating the ideas versus a more traditional or, you know, sort of? So what would you like us to do for you? How much are you the idea maker? And how much are you just the idea taker? You know, I. It, it, at this show that we did in Denver a couple of weeks ago, I asked, I, you know, I did the typical, so what keeps you up at night? You know, and my customer was just like, ah, ah. and I'm like, I know you know what keeps you up at night. <laughs> but just somehow, I found the conversation starts better if you put something in front of them. I mean, I did have a couple guys um, just draw a picture. So one thing that we haven't built yet, but is quite interesting is, you know, kind of going back to that, the compartmentalization of the, of the rig. So uh, here, um, I had one customer say, you know, I look at these wells and what I really want to do is I want to take this section, actually I want to take this section from this well and I want to combine it with this section from this well, and I want to combine that with this section from this well. And he drew that on a piece of paper for me, so before I you know, even had anything. But that's kind of rare that our customers will do this. I find that this generates conversations. So usually people are, it's easier for them to critique something that you've given them instead of just saying, here's my dream about what I'd really like this to be. So, you know, it, it, it's a little. There, we have a couple really visionary customers that have done some of these interesting things themselves. But yes. Do you have any customers who want to go the reverse way, like make a cross tab of this? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I've had that happen too. But they can get the data that way already, so that's that's pretty straightforward. Um, what they haven't had is the visualization part of it, but. Yeah, our customers can pull the data down any way they want right now. Um, but that's kind of what they've been doing. So this is more interesting and new. Can they, can they, do, can they do it often? Can they pull the data down directly often? Mm, not as much as you would like for that to happen. So especially because, I mean, the industry is just crazy right now. There's just so much going on. There's not enough labor to do all the jobs that are there in the industry. And so um, 
you know, it's just they don't have much time. So some people do. I would say it's a small percentage, though. I mean, like, I don't know, 10 to, I don't actually have numbers on this, but it's smaller than you would expect it to be, given how important it is to do this right. So, yes? You mentioned trying to build something for the masses. Is this something that you're offering to all of your customers? Right. That would be, that's the idea, that it would be available to all of our customers. Um, you know, just as another line on the price list, right, kind of thing. Yes? Can you download the FISC from your website so people um, from your program, can people download the desktop so that they can play with it? Can no, it? we don't have that kind of um, relationship with Tableau at this point. I can see that being some place that we get to for the future, but that's not. They can download the data, right? So they've created a visualization, right? And now they want the data associated with what created that, so they can do that. Right. But the actual workbook, no. Just not that that can't be possible, right? Just it's not what we're doing right now. Other questions? Good. Gosh, those were a lot of questions. I'm very surprised. Thank you so much. This is fun. <laughs>